just two hours, one of these men will be the new world champion. Cinque secondi. Imagine a scene where the first seven racing cars are fighting so close to each other that a vast tarpaulin could easily conceal them. Picture this setting on the historic Monza circuit on the straight stretch that now connects the Ascari chicane to the infamous Parabolica. It was here in this high speed section that an unforeseen and tragic event unfolded. In progress at Monza. In the first lap of this grueling 267 mile race, all went well. Then in the second lap, approaching the curve on the inner section of the road circuit, it happened. It's mind-blowing how things used to be. What's even crazier is that even the fans were at big risk. On the back of racing tickets, there used to be a small print giving a heads up about the dangers of motorsport. Even though cars have gotten a whole lot safer in the past 70 years, there are still times when, tragically, bystanders end up paying the ultimate price. Take the 1961 Italian Grand Prix as an example. With their iconic 156 shark nose and drivers like Phil Hill, Richard Ginther and Wolfgang von Trips, Ferrari was the talk of the year. This beast was kitted out with a 1.5 litre dyno engine, later pimped up to the Silkia V6. Breaking away from Enzo Ferrari's usual love for front engines, this mid-engine beast packed a hefty 188 horsepower punch in 1961. Only Sterling Moss and Innes Island could break through Ferrari's iron grip on victory that year. Moss started the season with a bang, nabbing the top spot at the Monaco Grand Prix and then he went and did it again at the epic Nürburgring in Germany. Even with Ferrari rocking a speedier car, Moss and his Lotus crew pulled off a stunning comeback on the more challenging circuits. Let's watch Sterling on this final lap as he drives into our memories with an unforgettable display of virtuosity. Moss owned it in Monaco and the Nürburgring, while the rest of the season's showdowns were at Zandvoort, Spa, Reims, Rome, Aintree and Monza, with a final hurrah at Watkins Glen. But Ferrari decided to sit that last race out. Ferrari was a beast on tracks that craved raw power. Even so, there wasn't just one driver who accumulated victories during their rule. Von Trips bagged some wins and Phil Hill rocked it at Spa. Giancarlo Baghetti even swooped in for a win at the French Grand Prix in a Ferrari he entered on his own. As the season zoomed towards Monza, four drivers were gunning for the title. But really, it all came down to a showdown between Von Trips, the German ace, and Phil Hill, the American hotshot. the Italian Grand Prix in progress at Monza. Monza wasn't just another race, it was the grand finale, the ultimate test of what these speed machines could do. The European Grand Prix at Monza is more than a motor racing classic. It's the last of the year to count towards the World Racing Championship. The underdogs use these races to push their cars to the brink, all revved up for the next season, with their new ride set to debut in six to eight months. At epic showdowns like Monza and Watkins Glen, teams would sometimes roll out next season's cars if they were good to go. It was like the grand finale of the season, with everyone going all out, pushing boundaries and hyping up what the future held. Back in the day, Monza was the ultimate playground for speed junkies, especially when they had the full oval setup, a whopping 10 kilometers, where you're basically flooring it with only two spots to hit the brakes at the first Lesmo and the Parabolica. It was wild. Imagine this. The cars would blast off from the same starting line as they do today, tearing through the familiar track, but without those annoying chicanes. After rocketing out of the Parabolica, they'd veer right, blasting past the pits and onto the legendary banking, which would hurl them right back onto the start-finish straight. Give 
given how insanely bumpy that oval was, it must have been heart-stoppingly scary. A banking. It's just so damn rough up there that the car flicks all over the place. We're never below 180, you know. And at that speed, your reactions can barely keep up with these sudden changes in direction. The trouble is, the high centrifugal forces push the car into the banking and use up all the suspension movement. So what you're driving becomes a car with no springs. It feels like you're getting a series of punches in the back. But it's what the car is suffering that really worries me. Just a year earlier, the Italian bigwigs decided to run that wild combo of the oval and the boot-shaped road course, basically handing Ferrari a victory in a season they were already owning. The British teams pieced out of that race, freaked out by how unsafe the oval seemed. Zoom up to 1961 and the teams were back, but still freaking out about the safety of the oval. To ease their minds a bit, the race got trimmed down to 430 kilometers instead of the usual 500. That's 43 laps, not 50. The organizers were like, not a fan? Then don't bother coming. But the teams bit the bullet, and a whopping 37 cars lined up. From Italy, one honored name, Ferrari. From Britain, BRMs, Brabham's, Coopers, and Lotus. You could cut the tension with a knife as they prepped for the legendary Monza track. Out of the 37 Dreamers, 32 Speedsters clocked in quick enough to make the cut for the race, and that's not even counting the pole position. Nowadays, we've got the 107% rule. Back then, it was 115%, based on the second fastest time. Ferrari showed up with a killer lineup. Their usual stars, Hill, Von Trips, and Ginther, plus a hotshot Mexican rookie, Ricardo Rodriguez. Ricardo Rodriguez was the guy who set the bar at 311.3. These four Ferrari aces snagged the top spots on the grid, leaving Graham Hill's BRM eating their dust by 2.4 seconds. And get this, it even poured during qualifying. Come race day, the track was sizzling under a blazing sun, bone dry and ready for action. The 32 cars lined up like gladiators. In just two hours, one of these men will be the new world champion. Cinque secondi. Hill and Clark were on fire, blitzing their way to the front thanks to a killer start. The Ferraris, built for sheer speed, found themselves playing catch-up. They hit the banking after the pits, and it was Ginther, Clark, Phil Hill, Rodriguez, Von Trips, Brabham, and Baghetti in a high-speed chase. Phil Hill, the American underdog, felt the weight of his nation's hopes on his shoulders. Wolfgang von Trips, carrying the pride of Germany, battled not just his rivals, but his own inner demons from past crashes. At speeds reaching 180 miles an hour, a race car is making a big hole in the air. The only thing to do here is to drive just as fast as you know how and hope your car doesn't break. From the thrill of speed to the lurking fear of the unknown, as they barreled towards Parabolica on lap two, things got really intense really fast. <laughs> were so close, it was heart-in-your-mouth stuff. You could feel the tension ready to explode on the track. But then disaster struck on the straight stretch between what's now the Ascari chicane and Parabolica. Clark's Lotus and Von Tripp's Ferrari brushed against each other, and that tiny touch was enough. Then in the second lap, approaching the curve on the inner section of the road circuit, it happened. <laughs> With just a thin safety fence to protect it, the Ferrari flew off the track and up the embankment, right where spectators were. The spectators were way too close to the action, right up against the fence. Fifteen people tragically lost their lives. Remember, this was the era before seatbelts, and Von Trips was hurled from his car. There's this haunting photo that captures him lying beside the track, and it's painfully obvious he didn't make it. In those few seconds, the race ceased to be a sport and became a tragic tableau. Most people there shrugged it off as just another hazard of the sport, part of the thrill and spills. 
But as the race roared on amidst this unfolding disaster, the real weight of what happened started to sink in. After this race, Formula One never touched the banking again. It became a ghost of the track. Despite facing demolition threats time and time again, it's still there, standing silent but speaking volumes about those who dared to chase glory at breakneck speeds. Jonathan Munster coming to the last corner. Aaron and the Yomura is right on his tail. He can still beat the BRN to the flag. In the wake of the Grand Prix, some news stories tried pinning the blame on the banking for the Clark Von Tripp smash-up, really playing it up to push for track changes. But then, two plane crashes happened around the same time, killing way more people and kind of drowning out those voices. It's a stark reminder that it's not just the drivers who put skin in the game. Fans, just by being there, can end up paying a heavy price for the wrong place at the wrong time, no fault of their own. The tragedy at Monza in 1961 wasn't just a story of motorsport, it was a human story, one of triumph and loss, of bravery and vulnerability. It was a reminder that behind every helmet and every cheering fan, there was a story, a life, and a world touched and changed forever by the events of that day. As the sun set on the Monza circuit, it marked not only the end of the race, but also the beginning of the legendary Monza track as we know it today. What's also crazy is that accidents like these didn't make the sport much safer in the aftermath. Not until 33 years later at the San Marino GP, which finally was a wake-up call big enough to start the safety crusade we know today. Take a look at our other video about the Grand Prix weekend that cost almost three lives and changed Formula One safety forever. If you've made it here, I'm really grateful and I hope you can leave a like and subscribe.